are you guys watching have you or have you guys been watching the the january 6th uh the hearings or whatever the uh the big the big to do uh in in dc the day that will live in infamy <laughs> i are you guys watching it though did not plan to but i have been i can't stomach watching the like live shots of all of it so i've definitely been getting the highlights which i'm sure is pros and cons but it's just it's just i, I they really are gonna run on this huh <laughs> and that's what it feels like for me right now so i'm astounded yeah. it's a big deal don't get me wrong but. yeah yeah i mean that's usually how i oscillate with it too um my feeling on it has been, and I wasn't planning on putting much time to it because in as much as I despise the Republican Party and everything that it has become, right? It's a neo-fascist organization at this point. You I liked do, it before though, right? Well, I used to love them, yeah. When, <laughs> when it the was just, there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just the party, the party for free market account laissez-faire right. you know um no uh never a big fan but i also do not respect the democratic party and i do not think that anyone of consequence will be prosecuted in this yeah that was going to be my next question you think you think they got trump this time you think trump is going down this time <laughs> It's oh this, this is the time. They really got him this time. Yeah, it's. Yeah, I don't I feel, know. Wait, what's what are your thoughts, Sky? I mean, I you know this to me, like obviously, you know, I don't want to like completely make light of it because it is like ultimately in like the history, like this country's history, it is a big deal. Yeah, but like this, this whole process to me is just more molar stuff. Where like I feel like all the libs are like, we got him. Like we we're closing in on them, and it, like it just it's the, <laughs> the same thing. The Obama, thing where, ladies and gentlemen, where, <laughs> where I'm like, we aren't closing in on him. Like, stop <laughs> doing this to yourself. And like, I get why. Like, I get why the news stations are all about it because it's big news. And like on like again, I'm not trying to like make light of the thing because like it was a big deal. Um, and like what is happening with with the Republican Party is is a really huge deal and it's terrifying um but this whole thing where they're like gonna like lock up some of the most like or like you know prosecute like the most powerful people in the country or whatever it's like dude this country is way way too corrupt <laughs> to do that like stop and it, and it bums me out because so my my parents were visiting uh recently and they were watching it um and he, my dad's the kind of guy he like, and he like he, he's my dad rules, and he like, and he's and he wants to like, you know, he wants like every anybody else for like Trump to go down, but I like I watch him get his hopes up on this stuff, and that's where I'm just like, dude, stop, stop, do it, don't do it to yourself. Trump is Trump will never see the inside of a jail cell. Mm. Also, if I'm wrong about this, I will gladly eat that slice of humble pie like i i would love nothing more than for that dude to just get like thrown in a gulag somewhere um and and humiliated and have his life ruined or whatever i mean he's a terrible guy i wish him all the worst uh but unfortunately <laughs> in this in this country people of donald trump stature and i guess there's kind of not too many people of donald trump stature um but they don't they don't get consequences in the same way that the rest of us do you know so it's it, i don't know like it's it's more it's more Mueller stuff to me where they're gonna they're doing the thing where they're like oh my god we now have definitive proof that trump did all this blatantly illegal stuff and everybody's like okay Neat. that'll be it yeah that sucks i guess you know <laughs> i i think it's possible that the feds i don't think the doj will do it but i think maybe like some kind of i don't know some kind of district attorney will would uh, could um or attorney general like for a, a state um bring charges against him based off of this 
I just don't think it sticks. I, whatever it is, I don't think it sticks. And um, I think they're waiting too, probably until the this committee finishes everything. But I'm, I have no hopes of any of that. I am now watching it just because it's like I'm interested by like how. I don't know, the shift in zeitgeist, I guess, and sort of how our country is collectively responding to this in the, the various ways. Like, I think, I think that will be a good indicator for us on what the greater capital L left should do moving forward, even though we don't have any, any power on a federal level. But like, it's, I guess it's just worthwhile watching. Yeah. Um, I had something I was going to say and I totally forgot what it was so that's my contribution uh, for now <laughs> <laughs> yeah what do you think Claire I think that like the window for something like this to be effective is like we're so long past it <laughs> like um, I don't know it just seems like the national attention is so many other different places right now the one bit that I did catch was um, there was this cop that was interviewed. Um, she did a great job doing giving her testimony, but she kept saying like, cops are not trained for these situations. We're not trained to be in a war zone and all this stuff. And which like, like, don't get me wrong. It does seem like the DC cops were, were like extraordinarily either unprepared or purposefully incompetent in this situation but I don't know it just like it's like what was all of the George Floyd protests then like I'm pretty sure it's like I, I don't know that just doesn't hold water with me well willing all. willing to use you know less than lethal munitions against black folks and their allies as opposed to this situation where it's like a, yeah. a sea of just like Chuds. Chuds. <laughs> There's yeah. some dude well, in fun. like wearing buffalo horns, like walking out of the White House or the, of the building yeah. with like a podium, yeah, like over his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> like, and the cops never once would they have considered using any kind of force beyond like you know hitting them with a stick. And yeah, I think that's it. It shows in pretty clear relief what this is about. I'm surprised that Trump didn't announce this week. Honestly, I thought he would do yeah. it um, just to be just so he could be like, this is just to, you know, this is an attack on my presidential campaign and blah, 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 blah. I thought for sure he would take advantage of this and announce his candidacy. But I guess I'll have to keep waiting. You know, coming it's coming. soon. Uh, yeah. You know Maybe it's, it's after the sixth day. That, that's when he runs. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's it. All right. Well, until then um why don't we we've got a show to do and we've got a lot to cover today so let's let's get it rolling all right voices the things they said voices i'm from those days all the voices heard Hello, everyone. You have Kempa. And you have Skylar. And Claire. Yes. Uh, special guest host today, Claire. We'll get to you in a second. No flow, no Shannon. Uh, they will be back at the end of our break. Uh, for folks who don't know, we are taking a one-month summer break uh, between the middle of June and the middle of July. Uh, I do not have the date in front of me that we will be back, but it will be mid-July. Uh, not only that, we've got a, a hangout that we're considering starting up pretty soon. We'll let you all know. But Claire, you are an organizer with SAC DSA. Um, I'm really glad you decided to come on this week uh, for a final, like before before a little break too. Um, you know, you you organize with SAC DSA. That's that's how I know you. Um, but it says here, well, I don't know what this is, that you are an occasional swim lesson instructor. So I just think doing God's work here. 
try my best. Yeah. Negotiating with diving toys and small children constantly. <laughs> Did you know um, that Dave used to be a lifeguard? Mm -hmm. Oh, me too. Lifeguard squad. Yeah, it's the best job. I hate being cold and I hate being wet though. And so that's the that's my favorite part about you as a lifeguard. I <laughs> every time you talk about it, I'm like I'm just thankful that my life was never in danger in a body of water when you were in charge of saving me. There was having, like having been in bodies of water with you. The few saves I've had to do, it was like <laughs> I like right before I blew the whistle, I was like, son of a bitch. I can just imagine you sitting up on that big stand being like, like watching somebody drown and being like, hey, man, you good? Hey, dog. Hey, man, you, you okay down there? Are you waving? Yeah. Are you gonna? Yeah, you gonna? Hey, can somebody check on that? Uh, oh, man. Okay. All right. Me, I'll get... I got it. Okay. Got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm going. Um, yeah, this is. That's why I, I lasted three seasons doing that. Actually, I, it was actually the best job of my life. I loved it so much. <laughs> um, but enough about that. Uh, we have, I think we have a really interesting show today. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the greater um, police reform movement um, or in some spaces, the police abolition movement and, and decarceration movement. Um, and I wanted to start, obviously, through something that happened very uh, close to us geographically, just over in San Francisco. Chesa Boudin, the <laughs> district attorney. We looked that up on YouTube, and that's how all everyone's saying it, even though Google tells you to say Chesa Boudin. Chesa Boudin, yeah. So <laughs> whichever yeah. one it is, this yeah. is, yeah. Um, apologies to the Boudin family. Um, but, uh, he was the, um, very progressive district attorney of San Francisco. Um, and he's been successfully recalled, uh, this June, uh, in the elections. Um, this is, there's a couple things going on here. Number one, for the greater left, I think, you know, like for, for not just progressives, but for socialists and beyond, um, he was a very important symbolic figure to us. Uh, he comes from a family of, of real ones in the leftist movement. Uh, his parents were both in whether underground, they served prison terms um, for a robbery that resulted in deaths. Um, actually, I would highly recommend this book, Outlaws of America by Dan Berger, um, basically giving the full story of Weather Underground and giving it from a leftist perspective. This is AK Press, so uh, highly recommended there. Um, but, you know, Boudin's sort of um, passion uh, in reform comes stems from that, stems from growing up. Uh, with parents who were in prison and and not being able to have the the childhood with them that he that he would have liked, um, am I missing anything here on him? I mean, I think that's a decent background. Okay, um, and he came in as part of a sweeping movement uh, after the you know really the buildup of years and years of the Black Lives Matter movement, and then uh, God, we can go back decades before that too but like i think that's kind of the more recent starting point um that then uh i think in we've seen over and over again here in sacramento stefan clark and then in minneapolis george floyd and then like countless other situations where there's a lot of civil unrest and people really do want to see change in uh in how we interact with the police and rethink how we view our carceral system we per capita uh i we have a, a wildly overrepresented population of people imprisoned in our country uh and so you know folks do want to rethink that but there was a recall push um, this recall push, and we can get in more into that in a bit, but it, the recall push kind of consisted largely of pretty far right donors, uh, who then sort of worked together 
with uh, a lot of the moderate Democrats in San Francisco. Uh, and we've seen it over and over again. I think a lot of establishment Democrats feel no qualms teaming up with with the really the the fascist arm of the country at this point um to to defeat the these you know sort of leftist uh politicians is that is that a pretty good background i'd say so the only other thing i would say is that um chaso was endorsed by san francisco dsa as well um something that applied to me when we were considering endorsements as absolutely a yeah yeah um and yeah i mean he was just a really important figurehead in in the entire movement throughout the country which is why i think to a lot of leftists this is a big blow um i don't think it's as much of one as it feels like to a lot of us necessarily outside of san francisco but it's still big um i wanted to talk about first um what the storyline was go skyler i was just gonna say there's there's an interesting statistic that i just became aware of today uh regarding uh his recall and that is that so he was voted in and um it like in rank choice he got 36 percent of the vote right so that's how he came into the thing the final numbers on the recall were 55 to 44. So he actually wrote like, so 44, almost for, nearly 45% of the people who voted uh, in the recall voted against recalling him. That is actually like, that is a climb in support <laughs> numbers. Um, if you view it through a, like a certain lens, right? Cause he, it's not like, he was elected overwhelmingly. And if you, there's a, I, I think there is a way that you can interpret these numbers to show that he actually gained some support. It just wasn't enough in the face of what he was facing. I think systemically, that's, that's a really important point um, because in these recall situations, it shows you just how undemocratic uh, this is. Because now London Breed is, judge jury and executioner the mayor of san francisco and she gets to decide who will be the next uh district attorney of san francisco and it could be anyone you know she she definitely leans mod um and has started using tough on crime rhetoric in recent uh months yeah that's a really important point so i wanted to talk about sort of the main narrative that came out directly from libs um, sort of the mod Dems, as well as the, you know, no one likes to call themselves a Republican in San Francisco, but like, it's the interests of capital, right? Um, there was a piece that was so incredible. I thought that we all should read it, even though it was like, like 7,000 words uh, in the it's Atlantic. So long. Incredibly long. Not necessarily so long. long. <laughs> but it, and it's all anecdote too. Like how many, I don't remember. I think I've saw like four uses of actual statistics in this entire piece. It was all like, well, some say like, like I'm watching like the five o'clock fucking news. Nellie Bowles. I don't know who knows her here, but you might have read this and been like, wow, you know, as she's painting this picture, like, I guess she's painting like a really good picture of the contradictions of capitalism. Like this might go in like a really interesting direction. And the more and more you read it, the conclusion she lands on, you're like, I'm sorry, what? Like, well, she doesn't land on a conclusion other than the fact that like leftists are bad. That's the only conclusion yeah. she the, like. She doesn't actually land on any like this is she never once does she come within a million miles of being like, here's a plan that I think would work uh, to combat all the problems that I'm seeing. She doesn't even like begin start down that path. She's just like, I know it doesn't work. And it's like caring about people who are struggling. Oh um, this is what I another... like to call oh, vibes journalism, <laughs> like for back, lack of a better term. It's just like 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 you both said absolutely no 
very little actual data and what's there is like pretty slanted and then yeah just like personal stories anecdata and vibes are the basis of this article and vibes so, like, journalism yeah it's just <laughs> yeah she can't it's, this person can't land the plane in this article and oh it went forever well let me just do, let me read like the first paragraph. Yeah, before we do this, I want to start this off by saying that in, so in the about the author section at the beginning of the article, it says Nellie Bowles, the author of a forthcoming book of essays, writes a column in the newsletter, Common Sense. Now, <laughs> like, let me, in case you aren't already hip to this. Any time that anybody has like a publication or like a comedy special or anything where they're like, the name of this is common sense, buckle the fuck up because you are about to hear some fucking bananas shit. Um, any, anybody who goes off on the, on the common sense stuff at this point in the game is just like, oh man, what are you going to say? Not only that, it's... It's a hearkening back to Thomas Paine common sense too, right? So you know, you know it's going to be some fucking pseudo intellectual drivel, and right. this did not disappoint. Um, so let me just like read the beginning of it, just so like listeners can get a, a good idea of of the tone. This is in the Atlantic. San Francisco was conquered by the United States in 1846, and two years later, the Americans discovered gold. That's about when my ancestors came. My German great-great-great-grandfather worked at a butcher shop on Jackson Street. The gold dried up, but too many young men with outlandish dreams remained. The little city, prone to earthquakes and fires, kept growing. The beats came, then the hippies. The moxie and the hubris of the place remained. My grandmother's favorite insult was to call someone dull. I learned young that it was impolite to point when a naked man passed by, groceries in hand. If someone wanted to travel by unicycle or be a white person with dreadlocks or raise a child communally among a group of gays or live on a boat or start a ridiculous sounding company, that was just fine. Between the bead curtains of my aunt's house, I learned you had to let your strangeness breathe. It's beautiful. <laughs> Nelly. I mean, I, I so far like okay, like the setup, like live, live and let live. If that is the message, yeah. I'm here for it. Like, all right, Nelly, where are you gonna go with this though? It is telling you. Go ahead. No, just like were this the thesis of the piece, as Skyler right. said. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, all right, yeah, we're freaks. That's good. A little thing though. And, and I didn't notice this until, you know, I saw people posting it about it on Twitter. <laughs> Nellie Bowles' great, great, great grandfather, who she fashions to be a butcher in like a local shop. <laughs> this guy is Henry Miller, a land baron who at one time was the largest landowner in California. Like she comes from imperialist royalty. <laughs> She's a direct descendant of him. You know who else is a direct descendant of him? Tucker fucking Carlson. Like this is, this is the family that Nellie Bowles is in. And like, she's writing this piece sort of like, you know, man, we just got too progressive, man. This is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> so like i i thought that was fascinating like just just the fact that she is this closely tied in with the the kind of how would you put it it's it's uh the 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 vipers who took all the resources her family today is a part of farm families who are trying to privatize water in california like this is this is the world that Nellie Bowles lives in. She used to go to like, like debutante balls. Like this is not your random person in San Francisco writing this piece. Um, I don't want to read too much more in this part of it. Let me let me hop down a few paragraphs just towards the end here. She's basically you know painting a picture about why she loves San Francisco, and then she says. 
but I do need you to love San Francisco a little bit, like I do a lot, in order to hear the story of how my city fell apart and how it just might be starting to pull itself back together. Because yesterday, San Francisco voters decided to turn their district attorney, Chesa Boudin, out of office. They did it because he didn't seem to care that he was making the citizens of our city miserable in service of an ideology that made sense everywhere, but in reality. Oh, such a lib fucking take. It's not just about Boudin, though. There is a sense that, on everything from housing to schools, San Francisco has lost the plot. Th that progressive leaders here have been LARPing left-wing values instead of working to create a viable city. And many San Franciscans have had enough. Okay, can we, real quick, real quick. San Francisco is like, I mean, and this applies to Sacramento in a lot of ways too. And I mean, honestly, in basically every city in the country at this point, but San Francisco is like the pillar of income inequality. Like they are the oh, finest yeah. example of Absolutely. income inequality in the country, right? Like they are... I mean, like I said, it's kind of everywhere, but only in San Francisco. I mean, and maybe New York. I haven't been, but do you see people living in like twenty million dollar mansions, and then literally across the street, people are like dying in tents, right? Like it is like it is stark, and not only, <laughs> and it, and it has been for my whole life, but like in the last ten years, it has gotten so 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 much more extreme and so 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 much more stark and like of course if you pull all of the wealth and resources out of communities that don't have very many things and just throw it upstream and like t and basically make it impossible for anybody to have any kind of like normal quality of life or any kind of like you know yeah, any kind of quality of life that isn't completely shit, then like things are going to start to go bad, especially when it's the majority of the people who live in your city that can't afford to like buy groceries anymore. Things are going to get bad really quick. And it is like, they that is never referenced in this, in this article. And it always, that is always a thing that like suffers when we talk about, it, it gets passed by when we have these conversations. It's just like, what do you, I would like to know what the author of this article's like thoughts are on where we'll be in 10 years. Like what is, where do you see, like to me, this seems like an unsustainable trajectory that's just going to get worse and worse and worse until like, you know, there's a few awful options that we're going to, we're like, we're going to pick from um, down the road. But for like these kinds of libs, you, I just kind of want to ask them like, so, like, where do you see San Francisco in 10 years from now? Like, how do you how do you look at what's going on and imagine like a better version of this city where people aren't, you know, uh, ODing in the street and, you know, robbing everything in sight or whatever, you know, what she says in this article, like, how do you how do we get away from that and it is crazy to me that people who fancy themselves like progressives and liberals answer to this overwhelmingly is we need to just throw more people in jail like that is and crazy and it's terrifying because they might actually get their way that's that's the whole conceit of this piece yeah and i would argue scholar that like it's not even that the author avoids talking about like the complete and total like lack of basic resources for like poor folks in San Francisco. Like she explicitly argues against things like safe injection sites or um, like services for like harm reduction. And like, like the way she paints those services in this article is as if they are like supporting vagrancy and making our city worse. And like, I, I don't know. I just genuinely think that people who style themselves as this sort of liberal want to locate the problem like in individual people, in like homeless folks. It's like the reason you're homeless is your fault and it's a problem with you specifically. So once we get rid of all of you, then our problem's gone. The problem with crime is located in you specifically. Right. Well, because yeah, I, I think mean, like to your point, Claire, like 
that the actual solution to the thing and like creating a situation in which we are like uplifting each other and creating a society in which people have some sort of a stake in the world around them and some sort of hope for a better life rather than what we have right now. That's really hard. And I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, I try and be optimistic as I can, but I don't know that, that we achieve that, you know, at least not in this generation or several several to come i don't know that we figure out how to do that and like incarcerating people is a really easy like band-aid solution that's like that makes you feel like you're doing something to address the problem but i mean it's clear that it's not right i mean obviously i don't have to tell anybody listening to this show this but if you could like make people safer by locking people up the u.s would be the safest country in the world by like several times over uh and we're not and so like the just by nature of like watching the thing happen it disproves the effectiveness of carceral solutions to these kinds of things but the alternative is maybe impossible at this point you know so well, let's, i don't know yeah you know i i think it's i think you both brought up a good point um and that's that you know they're their argument being for just a more carceral system, right? Um, just like we had not too long ago. Um, I think what they don't understand that um, actually the the New York Times in their podcast, The Daily, uh, the reporter actually mentions this in, in, in a roundabout way, is that all we're doing, all the movement has been doing, or progressives even, so far, has been saying, stop harming people. Like, stop harming unhoused folks when you have nowhere for them to go. Stop trying to put them in jail. Stop, you know, um, uh, arresting uh, folks who are addicts with felonies when, like, they need help. They need help. We need healthcare, we need systems in place for them. We're at that point where in some places we have gotten them to stop harming folks, but we don't hold the purse strings, right? DAs do not hold the purse strings in a community. And the purse strings are what determine sort of what that community, its morals are, right? What its principles are. Flo talks about this a lot, which is why she fights these fights as far as where city and county dollars should go, you still have to get buy-in from your county board of soups or for your city council or your whatever, your, your state um, legislature. Uh, you need them to actually invest in those things that will actually help people. And we're kind of at an inflection point where it's like, even if you've made inroads in some of these DA races, like you still don't have that support on the other side. So people are still feeling hurt right um and on top of that i don't know i just I, I guess i just wanted to add like i was so frustrated by seeing all these journalists like responding so positively to this piece when it's like like please just like read like a little bit of dialectical materialism just like it's showing you it's showing you the contradictions of capitalism right here right in front of you anytime you go to san francisco and the answers are something else. The answers are social housing. The answers are, uh, you know, healthcare for everyone, uh, a, a, a profound safety net that this country hasn't seen in a hundred years. Sorry, I got ranty. No, don't apologize. You're totally right on the money there. Um, I think it's hard being. Getting back to what Skylar said about the ranked choice voting method by which Chase got elected is uh, California recall laws are absolutely bananas. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all know that, and it's it, it allows for a situation where it's like, oh, do you do you really still want this guy that we've been like explicitly messaging against, like all the folks behind this recall? for so long, or do you want mystery alternative that uh, the mayor will get to select? And it's just, that shouldn't, that's like anti-democratic to me, um, the way that is run. And I don't know, like voter turnout, like recall wise versus like the his election 
but um that's a biggie um and yeah. you know honestly it's one of those things that a we do have to absolutely change our recall system um this is one of those things where a uh you know a monstrous whale can can change the will of the voters and that's not okay b um I had to be, oh, we should have these elections. These are important elections. We should have them on presidential years. Um, and I know that that folks have pushed for that in the past, um, but we want to do these in years that have higher turnout. Um, so more of the community is actually taking part in that discussion. All right, any yeah. last thoughts um, on this piece? Or well, yeah, actually I have, I have a couple. Um, Back to what you were saying about like, you know, giving like, like providing people with health care and kind of just like making it so that people making people's circumstances better to pull them out of um, whatever they're in. Um, she tells on herself so many times in this thing, like she is talking totally. to, she tells a story about like, oh, like, uh, oh, I actually have it right here. Some guy, there's like an unhoused guy who's bleeding uh, really badly and she says paramedics and police arrived and began treating him but members of a homeless advocacy group noticed and intervened they told the man that he didn't have to get into the ambulance and he had the right to refuse treatment so that's what he did the paramedics left the activists left the man sat on the sidewalk alone still bleeding um, a few months later he died about a block away so a couple of things about this I don't understand how you could take that scenario and not read that as like the most scathing indictment of the U S healthcare system. Like, how could you be like the yes. bad guys here are the activists who like came out to like, you know, be like, Hey man, if you get in that ambulance, like you will never make another dollar in your life. Like your whole life will just be debt from here on in. Right. Also the whole line, the closer line where she says a few months later, he died about a block away. It's like, so how so he lived that day then, like he made it considerably longer. This was not that like homeless activists killed this guy, uh, which is kind of the, the, that's, the that's her that she's trying to take yeah. here. Yeah. But she even says, she says several things that like, I feel like are like lib tropes with this, with this, uh, this subject. One of which is she says, uh, let's see, she has something about like, man, this used to be a place, you know, there were always uh, people experiencing homelessness here, but you used to be able to just kind of avert your gaze and, you know, focus on the other stuff, you know, and now it's really bad. And it's like, yeah, averting your gaze is what has brought us to this point. The fact that like you were just stepping over people who were suffering 20 years ago and everybody was doing that. And now we're in the situation where everything is like magnified and amplified and a million times worse. Averting your gaze is the problem. Like it's not, it's not like it's not like some golden age where like things were better or whatever. It's that attitude. And that that mindset that gets us in here. The other and one thing, of her answers is like put them in jail so then they won't yeah. do drugs. <laughs> like no, yeah, that's so. That's another thing is that she's talking to this woman uh, whose son is a heroin addict who is unhoused, my son. and she's and this woman is apparently on like a crusade to get the cops to arrest her son because she thinks it's the only way that he you know is going to survive he's going to get off drugs and survive and then like two sentences later she says he'd get sober after stints in jail but it wouldn't last and it's like <laughs> Jesus fucking christ like how, how are you not how can you not connect those dots like i like i don't know it's it yeah it's baffling to me but the number one the number one trope here that she really nails in, in this is that she says this fight is about leftists versus liberals which I mean I agree and as far as everybody knows my stance about like liberals and conservative is liberal and conservative is more or less interchangeable in California as far as I'm concerned mm -hmm. um, this fight is about leftists versus liberals it's about idealists who think a perfect world is within reach it'll only take a little more time a little more commitment a little more funding 
forever and those and okay so that's who the leftists are and then the other side is those who are fed up (laughs) it's like okay now first and foremost everyone is fed up everyone no no one thinks that the situation in san francisco is like a good situation that is operating as it should be that is not the that is not where anybody is but you also like being fed up is not a stance like it's not a it doesn't do anything like oh it's the first it should be a catalyst to like get you to move to come up with solutions to change the things that you're upset about but especially when it comes to homelessness it feels like people all the time are just like enough is enough i'm mad now and it's like okay so like what's the fucking plan then man like Like being mad about it is not, I mean, again, everybody's mad about it. Nobody, nobody in San Francisco wants the situation to be the way that it is. Everybody wants that to be different, but you can't just be mad at the people who are suffering and then be like, that's my solution. And that is her solution in this piece is just to be mad at the people who are like taking the worst brunt of the situation in San Francisco um and and yeah i don't know like that i guess that's like a pet peeve of mine to have people like be like i've had enough and i'm fed up in 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 this declarative like okay i've decided to like be engaged kind of a way and it's like okay welcome to the party we're all fed up it sucks for everybody's mad about it so like get in the game and and suggest some changes and skylar i think you've hit on something really key, which is like the difference in motivation between like libs and leftists for lack of, lack of a better distinction in a- approaching this, because it's like, oh, I cannot selectively ignore this problem anymore because the poverty is everywhere. And I don't know how to deal with that. It makes me feel bad. Let's just lock everybody up or make them go away so I don't have to see them. And that's a totally different motivation where from like leftists who are like, hey, what if um, maybe nobody should suffer? Maybe suffering is like a net bad for society and we should do things to avoid that because people like deserve to not die on the streets. Like this, like, it, uh, sorry, I, I don't say that. To, like people are dying on the streets, but the they don't deserve that. And I think that this author is like weaponizing that language in ways that make like really horrible arguments for soft incarceration. Like she does it the it, same way. Yeah, sorry. No, uh, my point is like if it takes cops to put you there, it's a jail. Like, yep. <laughs> she does it the same way that the the former um, editor at the the San Francisco Chronicle used to try and cover this, which is like. Like, I want to sound like, you know, I care and I, you know, I don't like to see this pain, but it's like, no, I just don't want to see people fucking in a tent, Mm -hmm. you know, like, that's what I really don't want to see. I'm, I'm skeeved out by the guy who's putting a needle between his toes. Like, like Nellie is saying, Nellie Bowles, by the way, is married to Barry Weiss, one of the worst conservative columnists in the country. Um, And I guess I just wanted to say, like, I I have a lot of touch points to addiction in my life. um, And I lost one of best friends to opiates uh, not too long ago. And like, like it, 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 it happens. It's around me. And it's just like, it's just really galling that this fucking debutante ball attending piece of shit thinks that she knows what the answer is to stuff like this. Um, there are there are not simple answers beyond a robust safety net, a community that circles around folks who fucking need the help. And we don't punish them. We don't put them in jail. We, we actually give them the things they fucking need. And that doesn't exist in this country now. It does exist for all of Nellie's like social circle. There, yep. there are people in Nellie's social circle who I'm sure do just as many drugs and struggle with addiction. It is not like the dr- like different types of drug use is stratified by like income and whatnot. But like those services exist. They're just for rich people. 
Yeah, and, it costs tens of thousands of dollars to to go to these these fantastic clinics, and I'm glad they exist. But it's like these should be for everyone. Everyone deserves this. Yeah, and yeah. also like I, it's again, just like sorry to like hammer on this, but like you know this story takes place in San Francisco, where like I, aren't there like eighty billionaires or something who live in San Francisco? Just yes. like, just yes. like this city of unimaginable wealth like people like like dozens of people who have more money than you could spend in a million lifetimes if you live to be 400 years old you know like it's a city full of that kind of wealth and they're like well this problem isn't solvable like there's no there's no way for us to like provide these resources where would we get the funding for this you know like blah 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 blah, blah. and like like i don't know how long i like how long can that keep working on people like i don't like how how far can you go with that where you're literally like a dragon sitting on a pile of gold being like i'd love to help but i don't know how you know the this influx of capital that the tech boom brought into that region she she treats it like a a, just a secondary thought, you know, like a fart in the wind in this piece. And that's the funniest part to me. It's like, that's central to it. And the fact that there's not social housing, affordable housing being built in that reason is the same reason for this influx of capital out there. It's like, these folks all own property there. And the less number of properties you have, the faster your property values go up. Like that's, they, the system is working this, the way it was supposed to. This is right. laissez-faire I mean, that's, that's capitalism. Thing. How are you going to sit there and watch the San Francisco housing market like go the way that it has gone for the last like several decades, and then like sit there and watch like I mean, what's is minimum wage in San Francisco is higher than it is here, right? Isn't it like is it like seventeen dollars or something like that? That's what I was going to guess. I don't know the exact number. I don't know the answer. Either way, it's like <laughs> it is nowhere near enough. To Not keep up with the cost of living uh, in in San Francisco, and it hasn't been for a really long time. And the and the gap keep between what we pay workers and like what you need to survive in places like San Francisco keeps widening. And it blows my mind that people like uh, like this like Nelly. I I mean, because she she you know she's thought of it, you know that she sees it and is aware of it, but like doesn't really know how to contend with it and so acts like that like that's not that can't possibly be what the issue it's so i don't know obvious it's like could not be more obvious and especially in a place like san francisco it is like punch it is like punching you right in the face and you're like nah i uh nah uh it's something else you know i feel like she's so out of touch on like where how far a dollar gets you like it's like the old arrested development line like how much could a banana cost, Michael? Twenty dollars? Like that's what this feels like with Nelly Bowles. Absolutely, yeah. and I also think that there's just like this unique strain of liberalism in San Francisco that has to do with like Silicon Valley as well, where it's like, oh, you know what? We can just disrupt all the problems of capitalism and ignore like the conditions we're working under. Like we just need to have like, it, it's just, I don't know. I'm using a bunch of different words to just describe technocratic solutions, but it's like, you cannot escape the fundamental system you are operating in, no matter like how crappy your situation, uh, your how crappy your solution is, like Airbnb is not gonna solve your housing crisis. No. Like, I don't care, like, <laughs> how hard do you try and push that? Um, yeah. But yeah. Can I, I I know we're running a little low on time so I was hoping to to sort of bring it to like what do what do we think that like the the real determinants of of the loss um for Boudin are, right? Um Who wants to go first, Claire? Yeah. Um one thing we haven't touched on yet is like for the past year at least we've been in a we've been dealing with a huge crime wave narrative um in a lot of just like syndicated media like my grandma for example um 
total conservative, like married a fucking member of the John Birch Society. Lovely, lovely woman. But um, she like, she is fundamentally convinced that if you step in San Francisco, you will get murdered and you will die. And that's like- I've been pushing and, that narrative for a while, actually, yeah. <laughs> oh, I see, yeah. You're, you're the man behind it. Um, <laughs> But just, it might be true if Dave is in San Francisco <laughs> with you. <laughs> but I just think that, like, within the article specifically, um, Nellie cites, like, all of these closures of Walgreens and how, like, shoplifting and horrible crime has, like, led to the downfall of this city. And it's like, if you actually look at why Walgreens is closing its stores, it's because they lost a huge wage theft wage theft settlement they got a new ceo they're paying cra like crazy they um bought out rite aid and already planned to close a bunch of scores stores and they lost a fuck ton of money with like the theranos scandal and it's like those are like the actual practical reasons why walgreens are closing its stores but it's being completely substantiated to to just like awful ends and yeah. it i don't know it's like they're a huge like I definitely think that like the crime wave narrative in like more mainstream media that we've seen over the past few years contributed to why Chase got recalled. I don't think you can separate it out. Totally. And it's an effective narrative that's lasted for 50 years. And um Chase entering office was, you know, it came in a two to four year timeline where we were actually pushing back on that narrative, but like they these folks tried to to wrangle that narrative again and to some success but also it's like it, i think there is just a reality of our situation right you know we have chesa was was in office during this pandemic um the 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 differences on on who has wealth and who doesn't got worse and worse everywhere in our country and we've already established that San Francisco is perhaps the worst place for that. The rise in crime narrative is incorrect in a lot of ways, in particular in San Francisco, because there was not a rise in violent crime. The rise in crime there is of crimes that involve some kinds of theft. These crimes, there are determinants for them. If Dr. Flo was on here, she could talk directly to that. It's because of poverty. When you get poor, you steal so you don't lose your home. This is like, folks, put in your VHS of fucking Aladdin. Like, this is this is how this works, you know. And I think like this this narrative was was sort of swirling um, before the recall. Yeah, I mean, people. I think you know, like we live in a world where a lot of people are super scared and. Like, and, and I don't, I don't know. I, I hate to like, I don't know. I'm trying to like, not come on this show and like do a bunch of fear mongering, but like, like do it. things are tough, right? Things are tough right now. You know, like things are hard. Things are hard all around, you know? And, and it is, it's one of those things where it, you just kind of keep waiting for people to be, cause it's not like things are working out great for wealthy people either. Right. Even the people who are like consuming all the wealth and like collecting it and hoarding it they're still mad that like you know they have to step over a turd as they walk down the street in san francisco like they don't it's not working for them either right and so and it and it is you know the thing that's a bummer about the the chase of boudin thing is that you kind of get to a point where you're like okay we've been doing the same we've been trying the same tactics and doing the same thing for like hundreds of years maybe maybe we should try doing a different and now we're in a situation we don't like that we're not happy that we're in so maybe we should try doing a different thing and taking a different approach uh to you know how we how we interact how we view our society and how we how we interact with each other maybe we should like take a you know take another look at that and make some fundamental changes and to have people just react with like no, we should just do what we've always done. And like expect this, like, you know, it's the Einstein thing where it's like, you know, it's the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, expecting a different result. But that is 
what we're stuck in, certainly in terms of like how we, how like the American incarceration system works, right? Like nobody's mm -hmm. happy with the way things are, but we're also fundamentally opposed to changing anything about the approach that we take. Um, so, and I don't know, I, like, uh, and I, th I think, I think a lot of that does come from fear because change is super scary and the kind of change that is necessary to turn this boat around in this country is seismic like it is like a a massive sea change um is needed uh to to right some of the problems that we have going on in this country and that is terrifying um but it's also necessary and the further the further we let ourselves walk down this path of like exacerbating the problem the harder it will be to untangle the knot if we ever get around to untangling it the the last thing I'll say that I think might have contributed to this recall is I don't think that I don't think we should underestimate the degree to which like the cops changed how they operated, like in response to Chase getting elected. Like some of that was probably like a push from the district attorney's office in a very good way. But like this is like when a strike is bad. <laughs> like this is when like cops like like, I, I don't know. I, I, I This is something that I don't know enough about to be talking about on a podcast, quite honestly. But I think that... Oh, this is where you time. go yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. talk about things we, you don't know about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Spout off. Um, I just think that, like... <laughs> If, if, uh, the cops are already pretty damn incompetent most of the time, and that's my opinion. But, like... I have a feeling that that was weaponized further after Chase got recalled, and I that probably contributed to like voter sentiment. I don't really see how it wouldn't, but Fully. That's, a, that's a sneaking suspicion, not something that's like substantiated. No, you're so. not incorrect. I believe it is substantiated that there was a, a slowdown uh, with how the police do things in San Francisco. Um, you know, the, the police officers association in his original bid for office, they spent $400,000 to keep him out of office. Um, they got very angry with him that, um, a man who was shot by a cop, um, that he decided not to charge the man for like throwing a bottle or something at the cop, um, like these, the, the police are central to this storyline. Um, then on top of it, and, and we haven't talked about this yet, uh, but there is within the Asian community um, a lot of folks who felt like they were not protected. Um, you know, they, this was during the pandemic, there was a, a huge rise in, in anti-Asian sentiment, right? Um, and there was a, you know, five-fold increase reported uh, by Asian communities on, on, you know, what they viewed as hate crimes against folks and, or hate behavior. And it's like, when they didn't feel safe, I think that the anti-chase of folks really, really grabbed onto that um, and used that to, to, to try and get that, the what is a very large part of the social and cultural fabric of San Francisco, you know, the Asian community, um, they, they wrangled that, uh, for the recall. Um, and the thing to me on that is, and maybe we move on to like one little final thing after this, but like the, the, the sad irony to me in that is that the same people funding Chase's recall are the very people who were out there funding folks who were calling it the China virus or the Kung flu, um, who were stoking this sort of anti-Asian sentiment. Um, and I don't know, that's just, that's kind of a devastating thing to, to see. I hadn't considered that, but that is, that's awful to think about. Yeah. Um, but and I, I want to round this out and I, we might go a little bit over. I hope that's okay. Uh, but I did want to round this out with a question on if this means the reform movement's over, right? Or if abolitionists have to crawl into a hole now or like, you know, um, because you also look at 
some races around the country and you see that things are not as bad as as it was in San Francisco. And again, San Francisco is a huge symbolic loss, but can I rattle off a few things here? In Philadelphia, Larry Krasner, a uh, progressive, maintained office uh, as, as DA. In Chicago, Kim Fox uh, fought off a push against her. Um, you know, we did have some losses in, in the state of California, and. Uh, hats off to Alexi Kosef, a uh, friend of the show, uh, for this fantastic piece in Cal Matters, um, sort of laying out that like the narrative that like, you know, oh, you better watch out progressives. This is the end of, you know, this whole thing. He's like, no, nah, it's not that simple. Um, were there some losses? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, Boudin's the biggest one. Um, the San Joaquin DA, Tori Verber Salazar. Um, she's a Republican, but um, was considered a part of the Prosecutors Alliance, which was the prog progressive prosecutors uh, who were uh, uh, district attorneys. There were four of them in the state at the time, but she was running for a third term. Like, obviously, when material conditions are getting harder for folks in any place, people want change. They're angry and they will vote against whoever is in office. I legitimately believe that um and then here locally in sacramento county alana matthews uh lost to tian ho um alana actually works for the prosecutors alliance um you know we we were hopeful for her but this one was gonna always be an uphill battle sacramento county is a lot more conservative than folks give it credit for um and this one was not a surprise to me but let's look at some wins here Dinah Becton of Contra Costa County. I've worked with Dinah before. She's pretty great. Um, she fucking crushed it. Uh, she won re-election. Uh, she too is part of the Prosecutors Alliance. Pamela Price over in Alameda County uh, ended up on top of the heap and will be going to the general election. Um, and she is very much um, one of those progressive types uh, for district attorney, Rob Bonta, this is state level. This is the attorney general. This is the progressive person. Um, I've got a couple issues with him. Of course, I'm sure we all do, but like he resoundingly took over half the vote, even with multiple candidates. The best part about this Sacramento County district attorney, Anne Marie Schubert was running for this office. She we all remember her for um, assassinating the character of Stefan Clark and for not charging the cops who killed him in his grandmother's backyard. She finished a distant fourth. That's a fucking big deal. Like that is a rebuke of Anne Marie here. You forgot to mention how she single-handedly solved the golden state killer thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Too bad. Yeah. Shannon's We're not going to list her. About <laughs> We're going to list her laurels. Um, she didn't folks. Um, <laughs> How dare you? And then we have uh, uh, Scott Jones, obviously, was running, I believe, for uh, what was he running for? For Congress? Uh, yeah, Assembly. It doesn't matter. He didn't make top two. So fuck you, Scott. Um, womp womp. Yeah, yeah, it sucks. Man, the hits keep coming. I, you know, I felt, I do, I still feel bad for him that uh, that Trump went for the other guy. Yeah. It's got to be, a that's a tough hit. Did you see after he lost, there was like, he, it was a very weird thing. He like posted a picture of his four daughters, like facing the ocean. <laughs> it had, see, is he marching them in? <laughs> yeah. It had a, like a Kate Chopin vibe. I don't know. Like, is this, it's all over for the family. Guys. Is this the, the end of the have won. Like... We will go and live amongst the sea people now. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, don't do it. No, no, it's not that bad, Scott. <laughs> you can't rely on us actually succeeding in decarcerating. Still very conservative, California. Here, Scott. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then I, I think a, a Alex Villanueva, the sheriff of, um, of Los Angeles County, um, a terrible guy. He originally ran on a progressive uh, platform, but he's gone real far right. He's on Fox News whenever he wants to be. He's now looking like he's in trouble. So like 
things are moving, even though it doesn't necessarily feel like it. Um, I think the next big question, and we're going to learn more about that in the coming weeks, but at George Gascon, another former DA of San Francisco County, uh, who is the DA of Los Angeles. Um, was he the DA? I think he was. Um, and uh, there's a recall effort against him. We will find out by July 6th if that's successful. But I think these big money push recalls, like they say something, but they don't say everything. I guess that's the the, the big picture of what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think that there are a lot of people who would love you, for us to like take away the idea that like there is no appetite anymore for police reform. And I think that everything you've said like betrays that idea. Um, and I, I, it's, it's hard to see a lot of um, conservatives and like centrist libs make the argument that like Asian Americans want more police because they're dealing with hate crimes, which is like a legitimate reaction to have. And like a lot of folks in like black communities feel the same way if you like ask the polling question in a very specific way. And so I have a feeling that like this strategy of like calling upon like over policed and like marginalized communities to like say what the democratic establishment doesn't want to say, which is we don't want to reform the police at all, is probably something that's going to continue. Like, because we saw it in the recall, we're go we've seen it through a lot of like push pulling of like black communities. Um, but yeah, that's just, that's something I have my eye on. And I, it's, that's not to say that like, that's not a legitimate reaction for those communities to be having. It's just, um, how that gets used in the political landscape. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, the arguments in politics aren't necessarily, they don't have to be, you don't have to prove something as causal for it to be effective or not in cultural or in political discourse. Um, and, and that's the thing that, that I think you learn in elections left and right. So when you have, uh, the day after an election, someone come out and say, hey, that's a message to blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, that's not how any election works. There's nuance, there's circumstance. Um, and, you know, there are real determinants for how things end up the way they are. Um, yeah. Skylar, do you have anything to add? I was just going to say that, like, speaking of uh, of being ineffective in political discourse, uh if i wanted if i wanted the most ineffective <laughs> of if i wanted to go if i wanted to find the heart of uh ineffectiveness in political discourse and i was on the internet uh and i went to my browser and i typed in www dot what would the next uh several letters uh that i would type be if i really wanted to get to the root uh of the discourse yeah, that's a good question. I'm really glad you asked because I think I have so an like answer I to that. Like I phrased that. Yeah, um, I really do think that um, I've found the the Larry Curley and Mo of ineffectual political discourse uh, on the internet, <laughs> um, and we even have a fourth person too. Uh, and this is a place that I like to call VoicesRiverCity.com. Um, go there and check out everything that's been happening. Um, you will find some of the dumbest and worst takes on earth. Um, and, <laughs> and, and it is just a joy. And I, and I think all of you, uh, listeners and viewers will benefit from it. Um, if you want to support this totally ineffective space, <laughs> yeah, you can, yeah. uh, We're, we are very ineffective. And so if you hate the show and uh, you hate I your money, yeah, then yeah. boy, do we have a fucking deal for you. <laughs> Tell it's them, a, Dave. This is a place called patreon.com slash voices river city. <laughs> <laughs> and you can throw away as little as five dollars a month and as much as 25 a month. Uh just just to just piss it into the wind. Um mm -hmm. and we would really respect you if you did that. Um 
It's owning the libs to do that. It really is. It's owning yeah. capital. We'll be uh, hella owned if you Yeah. Know. It's it's showing the capitalists who's boss by just throwing <laughs> us your dumb hard-earned money. Um, but <laughs> no, we we do love the work we do. We hope you love it too. And we hope you do continue to support us. Um, we plan on having a, a meetup in the coming weeks. Um, I've also had uh, folks reach out about the Follows the Money project. I think there's a lot of really important elections coming up locally, um, one of them being the District 5 um, uh, Board of Soups race with Jacqueline Moreno. Um, and so I'm going to amp that up. I've got volunteers. I'm really excited about that. And I think it's really important that we do follow the money on these races. So any support there is really helpful. Um, we are all on the socials. I'm you know Kempa at Y O U Y O U. Thank Y O U K N O W K E M P A. Uh, you can find me at Guillotine for you. That's Guillotine, the number four. Y O U. Shannon is at Shan N D Stevens. Flow is at Flow Jean. That's F L O J A U N E. And Claire, where can we find your incredible takes? You are one of my favorite um, uh, acerbic people on the internet. So, <laughs> so how can the folks find you? Um, I'm on Twitter at Lit Lisa Simpson. The best way to Hell find yeah. me. The, the avatar bad. is like Lisa Simpson with like bloodshot eyes. So that's me <laughs> um and i know yeah. y'all saying that voices is ineffectual is all unjust but this was one of the best ways i got my finger on the pulse of sacramento politics when i moved back um i went to college in ohio and came back here and um so y'all are effective i'm more politically educated so. that means a lot that's actually great. um no and and we do have folks um you know, talk to us about the show. And yeah, I mean, like, it feels like uh, we're building a following. And like, I really all that really matters is that we're helping to elevate the work that that folks are doing um, on the streets. And, and I guess just one final thought before we take our month off is that, you know, the day after the election, it was obvious Chesa was going to lose. But what I did see was my co-host Tibby last week and all of the um, folks who are about decarceration go out, build a, um, a, a real coalition of groups that um, were anti-carceral and, and police abolitionist and go right out in front of the County Board of Soups and, and work towards changing how they are using their money. So... You know, we we obviously talk electoralism somewhat regularly on the show, but I think the direct action people um, are just so so important, and and like they they are changing the way politics work in this town. So thank you to all of you who do that too. Yeah, uh, I would like to just add before we leave for a month. Um, like for one, I wouldn't like if you are listening to this, regardless of who you are, even if you're a whack lib, uh, I will put good vibes out uh, into the world for you. And if you aren't a whack lib, if you're a cool person, then the vibes that I put out are even cooler. And in return, <laughs> I would like for you to send us your good vibes, but more importantly, uh, send our send our absent uh, regular co-hosts uh, as many good vibes as you possibly can. Um, there's, yes. uh, you know, I'm not gonna not gonna say a whole lot about it, but uh, but we love Shannon and Flo dearly, and uh, we know you do too. Uh, and put that out in the universe, uh, especially now, please. Ditto. All right. Well, let's call it. Um... Thank you all for a phenomenal five months. We will see you on the other side of this and let's get ready for fall. Let's not actually, let's just enjoy our fucking summer. Sorry. Jesus. Kempa. <laughs> <laughs>